Welcome to the Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Vantage Circle, the leading employee benefits and engagement platform. Hi, everyone. This is Rohit from Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. And today, I'm excited to have Dr. Wayne Brockbank, who's a clinical professor of business at the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business. At the Ross School of Business, Dr. Wayne is a co-faculty director and co-instructor of the Advanced Human Resource Executive Program. Uh, and this session, we'll talk about how to develop a, a business-focused employee survey. Uh, welcome to the show, Wayne. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be with you. The, uh, if we were in person, this would be my 128th trip to India. But right now, it's only 127 because of COVID-19. So I've spent a lot of time in India, and it's been one of the great blessings of my life. So I'm v- more than happy to be with you and speak to you to not only your Indian colleagues, but your global colleagues that will be listening to this podcast. Awesome. So uh, it's very interesting that, you know, you've been here 127 times, but uh, was it related to your uh, work or through, through the college activity? Well, it's, it's about two thirds teaching for the university and one third consulting with, with some of your more important companies and uh, financial institutions in India. And, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Wayne, what got you interested in human resources and why are you so passionate about it? Um, I, why I'm interested in, yeah, I'm interested in, in human resource issues for two reasons. One is we have lots of data through the University of Michigan. We have at the University of Michigan the largest database in the world on HR professionals. And, and we haven't just asked what are the practices and competencies of HR de- professionals in their departments, but we've asked which, which of those practices at the individual and the department level have greatest impact on business performance and, and, uh, and what is that level of performance. So we have data that tell us pretty clearly that HR can have significant impact on business performance if it's done right. And, uh, and so I'm passionate about the potential of the collective HR practices to impact business performance. And as business performance is impacted, then employees are better off, leaders are better off, but in my world, even more important, customers are better off. With my assumption is that organizations don't exist for themselves, they exist to meet the needs of society. And we see that in certainly in some of in 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 some of India's leading leading companies. They not only provide great products and services, but they do it with the intent of making the people of India better off. Very interesting. And um, you know, many organizations are, are exploring new ways, such as you know, pulse surveys and real-time analytics to measure employee engagement and to use uh, large-scale surveys to gauge employee engagement. But but what do you think, you know, what makes a great employee survey uh, for a company who wants to understand about uh, employee engagement inside the companies? Okay, I feel, let me start with an assumption. Uh, One of my assumptions is that measurement in many departments is one of the most sophisticated and intellectually intense activities in that department. We certainly see that in finance. Finance is heavily a measurement activity. And some of the brightest people in your company focus on how to measure finance, how to measure money. The same thing happens in marketing. Some of the brightest people in the company focus on how to measure measure customer value uh, and and their statistic background and uh, and background in analytics are, are extremely high. And, uh, and so it, we find that in, and, and those, those departments don't rely on, on off the shelf surveys from consultants. They certainly don't in marketing and in finance. They, they focus their intellectual efforts on how to measure marketing, in this case, marketing and financial activities in a way that are going to impact business performance. So num- n- rule number one is that, uh, that, measure- that HR issues, human issues are more important or at least as important to measure and are more difficult to measure. So this is not 
just a simple off the shelf uh, activity that we use to measure the human aspect of business. It's complicated and it's important. And it requires a huge, uh, I, I think, a substantial amount of intellectual uh, effort in order to create and implement surveys that differentiate you from your competitors. Because if you're just using surveys that everybody else is using, then there's no competitive advantage in it. So that's my going in assumptions that uh, that it's a difficult issue and in order for and it's important and in order for HR to add competitive value it needs to be done in a way that focuses on your business not necessarily on on uh, comparing your results to other companies that's okay thing to do but that's not what's going to create competitive right. advantage if you're if you have if, if your survey results are similar to your competitors you've you've told your you've created no competitive value so anyway, that's just kind of an overall introduction of my approach and assumptions. Got it. And you know, are there any key considerations which uh, HR leaders need to have before conducting employee surveys? Absolutely. First, they, the first consideration is they need to decide what what the purpose of the survey is. Is the purpose of the okay. survey uh, is the purpose of the survey to simply track people's attitudes towards uh, tactical tactical practices do they like their pay uh, do they receive uh, com the communications they need to have do they receive the training they need to have do they work in a safe safe business environment so you can ask tactical questions and th th those are okay uh, you can also ask uh, questions about employees mental state we call those satisfaction surveys or engagement surveys. Uh, are they having good experiences of work? Do they have a best friend? You know, we ask questions like, do you have a best friend at work? Uh, would you refer, would you refer this company, uh, to a best friend to, to, uh, to work? So another purpose, second purpose would be to assess the mental, the, the mental state of your employees. The third purpose, which is the premise of, of the title that you've asked me to address today, is uh, is the purpose of the survey is to assess the extent to which the, the the your employees, including leaders, are thinking and behaving in ways that are directly aligned with business performance. And that's it. And you can you can do tactical practices. You can do employee uh, mental state, and and still not focus specifically on the behaviors and thought patterns that are required to uh, to have a high performing organization so my assumption today is that we're focusing on how to develop a survey that will result in business results that are directly aligned to business results that's my assumption today anyway got it and uh, what are the exact parameters you know we should look at measuring when you're looking at uh, developing such a such a business focus in voice survey, should it all be about uh, you know uh, about numbers, the, the profits, and and uh, you know the revenues you make? Uh, I just wanted to understand what the exact measurements uh, which HR leaders should look at. Okay, that's a great question. So the, the, that takes us to a fundamental question: What's the purpose of HR? The purpose of HR is to have responsibility for thinking about and framing and having and developing uh, people who are um, who are able to beat the competition. Because it's only if you beat the competition then does the collective workforce ensure its em employability. Um, so the purpose of HR is to create the human side of the business that is highly productive. And uh, and what do we mean by the human side of the business? The human side of the business has two components. It means that we have the individual people that are high, that can perform, but also are the, are the sum of the parts, do we make the sum of the parts, uh, equal to the whole? Or do we make the whole greater than sum of the parts? What that means is, do we focus on individual talent or do we, or do HR professionals focus on organizational capability? There's lots of research that's po that focuses on that most of competitive advantage is found in making the whole greater than the sum of the parts. That is, 
focusing on creating organizational capability in the context of having very good people. So part of the measurement challenge is, is to determine what are the organization capabilities along with individual capabilities that are required to, to have a high performing organization as well as individuals. Now, the question is, how do you do that? Well, if you're, if the purpose of the survey, if the purpose of the survey is to, is to, uh, help, help business leaders to understand how people are thinking and behaving in order to have high performance, then you, then as you design the survey, you have to start with what defines performance for your company. And you can't go to an off the shelf right. survey to do that. You know, off the shelf surveys are designed by definition to be, uh, to be generic, uh, you know, or cut and paste. So the first step, so let me, let me, let me kind of, uh, ramble here for, for a couple of minutes on the four steps that are required to develop a, a business focused survey. The first step is you need to have a clear understanding of what, uh, of what is happening in your external environment. You need to, the, you need to understand first what, what high performance means and performance, high performance is dictated by what the requirements of your, of your customers are. You need to understand here the re, in order for us to, to make our customers happy, we need to, we need to understand what's going to make them happy. <laughs> we, we need to understand what they require. Are they, after, are they after new products and services? Are they after low cost? Are they after on time delivery? Are they after convenience? Are they after high quality? Are they after service? What is it that the customers want more than anything else? We need to have a clear understanding of that because then we have to translate. We have to ask ourselves when we develop the survey, what kind of behaviors do we need from our people in order to meet the requirements of, of whatever the customer's requirements are? And those are going to vary from company to company. That's why off the shelf surveys don't do are, are, are questionable. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I talked to a colleague, uh, I won't give you the company's name, but it's an Indian company who told me here uh, about five years ago, okay. there's probably nothing that an HR department does better, does faster to discredit itself than to use an off the shelf survey. And the reason is that, that off the shelf surveys use a vocabulary and a logic structure that may not be exactly aligned to the language and logic of your business, including your customer requirements. So the starting point of, of developing a survey is to understand what the requirements of your customers are. So then you can begin to ask yourself, if those are requirements of our customers, then how do our people need to think and behave in order to meet the, those requirements? Then the second step is once we understand what the customers are requiring, then what is the firm doing to create competitive, what is the strategy of the firm? What are the sources of competitive advantage that your company is developing in order to meet the requirements of those customers? Uh, are we going to focus on innovation? Are we going to focus on first to market? Whatever the customer requires, we need to translate those into very specific uh, strategies and activities for your company. And those need to obviously be translated into specific metrics. Let's use an example. Fast innovation. Innovation is one of your, uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, your company needs to focus on to meet the changing requirements of your markets. Then you need to be able to translate that, that mandate for greater innovation in the firm into specific metrics, such as, what percent of our products come, what percent of our revenues come from products that are less than a year old. Uh, how many new products are we putting on the market every year? So you need to be able to translate those customer requirements into specific uh, business strategies that then have met metrics compared to them. Now we come to the third step, which is how do our people need to think and behave? How do our people need to behave? What are the behaviors they need to exhibit in order to meet, in, in order to 
uh, meet the requirements of our strategy that reflect the requirements of our customers. Now, I'm hoping that makes sense because if you're going to create a business focused HR strategy or performance focused uh, survey, then you need to start with the customers. You need to translate the customers into, into, into your strategy. And, and then, and only then can you say, what, how do our people need to think and behave in order to execute our strategy that will help us to win in the marketplace? That's the first three steps. Then finally, once we understand how our people need to behave differently in the future than they have in the past, so that we get better results in the future than we have in the past, then we can translate those behaviors into specific items on a survey. And now you've developed a survey that is exactly customized to the requirements of your strategy and your uh, market environment. That's the way you begin to develop a, a, a customer, a, a business and results focused survey. I'm hoping that that makes sense. Now you're, now you're developing items Absolutely. on the survey that are directly aligned with the, okay. with the performance requirements of your business. Poco in that quote, that was very well defined on, you know, what, uh, and, you know, HR leaders should, should look at when they're trying to, uh, create such service, which are, which are business focused, uh, uh, employee service. And, you know, once we have the end goal in mind, uh, you know, it becomes easier for us to, as to see what needs to be measured and how to improve uh, all those uh, you know parameters which which are, which are already measured. But uh, should an HR leader stick to a framework? Should they look at doing weekly surveys or annual or quarterly surveys, uh, or should it be a function wise or team wise? Uh, any, any thoughts on what is the framework we should look at when we're designing such uh, employee surveys? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, obviously, uh, th there there are two there are two philosophies, and I and I agree with actually, ironically both both philosophies. One is I think it's appropriate to do what we call spot surveys. Uh, you know, two or three questions, or not two or three, maybe maybe a half a dozen questions that get at specific tactical issues that arise during the course of of business, and those can be done on an as as needed basis, and you know those can be done whenever they need to occur. Uh, when COVID-19 arrived, pro arose, uh, several of the companies I worked with uh, did surveys almost immediately when it became clear that COVID was going to be an issue. They didn't wait till the end of the year or they didn't wait for a monthly, a monthly cadence. You know, when, a need, when the need arose, they, um, they, they developed and implemented some very important survey questions that were then helped them help to inform how things were progressing from a performance standpoint during the COVID crisis. So on a Nate on, but normally I would think about those spot surveys occurring at least once a, once a month, but, but only if there's a need, you know, the, the spot surveys don't exist as part of an ongoing uh, uh, tracking of, of specific issues. That it becomes uh, uh, only be, there. Only it would only be used as as the need arose for the con as the con this context changes. Now, having said that, I think there's an important role. Whereas I I criticize that that sometimes survey can discredit HR uh, by by using language and logic that are not consistent with with the business language and logic. But on the other hand. I'm a firm believer that there's that probably from a measurement standpoint and from a culture impact standpoint, surveys are probably one of the most important tools that HR departments have to impact the culture and behavior of their employees. So I'm a, I'm a great believer in the importance of surveys. Years ago, there was a professor at Stanford named Jeff Pfeffer. He's still very active, very, one of the brightest people that the HR field's ever turned out. He pointed out in some research that he did at Stanford several years ago that the greatest, imp that the greatest impact of surveys is not, the, is, not, uh, is not acting on the results, although he says you do want to act on the results. The biggest impact of most surveys is the questions you ask in the first, qu in the first place. That is, when if you send out a survey on an annual basis or whenever, 
that that uh, to the entire employee population what it communicates to the to the employees ah these are the issues that the senior leadership are interested in understanding and those and those questions then start to communicate to the employees this is this is where the company's headed and so the questions you ask in the survey are and the and the and they communicate the priorities and ways of thinking of of the company's leadership are as important as as the results themselves so that's just kind of an interesting perspective and jeff pfeffer like i say is indicate as i indicate is one of the smartest people that the hr fields ever turned out so uh so with the the surveys in place like that then then there are a couple of things you can do with these surveys that are very powerful um one is assuming now that you've designed the survey to account for the behaviors that your people needs to exhibit to be to to uh to achieve the goals of the company then then there then you also want to in the survey ask ask uh, this the the traditional questions about different organization leadership practices for example uh let me give you just some, some samples that you'll already be familiar with I understand the mission of my company. I understand the objectives of my department. My department's my goals are aligned uh, are aligned with with the goals of my department. I'm re rewarded for accomplishing my objectives. I'm rewarded for accomplishing my department's objectives. My job provides me the opportunity to perform challenging work. Um, uh, my company's processes enable me to achieve my objectives. Uh, the approval processes of my company help me to get my work done quickly and effectively. I, I hold myself accountable for being responsible for people in other departments. We share information. I share information with other people across departments. So there's lots of tactical questions you need to, you can ask. So let me tell you the magic that I see happening in a powerful survey that, that it can, can become the foundation of your HR of your HR strategy. So now you've got some questions that have to do with your um, with your behavior side and you've designed those to be consistent with the requirements of the marketplace and your strategy. Second then is you've done a diagnostic in the same survey, you've done a diagnostic of of, of leaders all the leadership and HR practices, staffing, measurement, rewards, uh, communications, uh, structure, relationship with leaders, how leaders are behaving and thinking, training, development. So you ask a whole bunch of questions about those. Now the magic comes in and there, I've seen this happen in very few companies, but in companies where it happens, the survey becomes a foundation of, of, H, of their HR strategy. Once you have now a set of questions that have to do with behaviors and a set of questions that have to do with leadership and HR practices, then you, what you do is show the statistical relationship between the two. So you can, for example, uh, in a recent client that I worked with, uh, they found that performance management was done really well, and it was having impact on the on, on all of the behaviors. So that was terrific. So we know that the performance management in that in that organization was doing well. And it was having the impact they wanted to have on its behaviors. So the good news is it's, it's working well and it's having impact. So don't spend a lot of resources trying to improve your performance management system. You don't want to fix something that's already working well. Then the same survey, I'm simplifying now that these results. Then, uh, then another thing they found was that, that senior leaders, the communications from senior leaders were done kind of an okay level. But they weren't having much impact. Um, they, they weren't having negative impact. They were just kind of they were done at a mediocre level, and they were having mediocre impact. Well, that's something now they need to pay attention to. Now you start to say we need to make sure our senior leaders are are more effective at communicating. And then in this company, <laughs> it happened to be the case that that the uh, that the reward system wasn't done well at all. That is, it was done at a poor level. And not only was it done poorly, but in some cases, the more people paid attention to the reward system, there was a negative relationship with some of the behaviors they wanted. 
for example, this company wanted greater cooperation across departments. But there was a negative correlation between the reward system and the sharing of information across departments. How could that happen? Well, the reason was, is people were being rewarded for their silos. So the survey helped, helped to pull out, this wasn't being done very well, and as a result, um, we were, it was reinforcing uh, a lack of sharing across departments, which is one of the behaviors this company said it needed to have in order to meet the requirements of its strategy and its, and its customers. So again, the last step in a survey is to be able to statistically show the relationship between your leadership and HR practices and the behaviors you want. So you can define which of your leadership and HR practice areas are having the impact, either positive or negative, that you want them to have. So you know, so you therefore know whether to reinforce the existing practices or you need to change them to make sure that they're creating and sustaining the behaviors you need to have to have a high performance organization. So I think that's the bundle. That's the way you think about, I think, a comprehensive approach to developing and implementing an HR, a uh, employee survey that can, that can both drive business performance, but also can help make sure there's a linkage between behaviors and and uh, your your employees' behaviors and the business performance, but also to show the re relationship between your HR and leadership practices and those behaviors. So you can either reinforce them or change them so that now those behaviors are aligned with the requirements of your customers and your business strategy. I think that's a different way of thinking about an employee survey, but I've seen some companies go that route. Some, in fact, some companies, some very, very good companies in India have gone that route and it's had great impact on their performance. Correct. Yeah, no, that was very nicely put. But I also want to understand, you know, what, uh, what survey tools would you suggest, uh, with regard, uh, you know, uh, survey tool companies like, uh, uh survey monkey or Google forms, uh, type forms. Are, are there any, ideal choices for HR leaders who, would, who should look at uh, using such online uh, employee survey tools? Oh, I think the, I think the online employee service tools are, are a great idea. That's a, 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 a Qualtrex and Survey Monkeys. I think those are great platforms to getting the work done. But the, the content of the surveys need to be customized within the context of your business using, using kind of generic and very effective, low-cost platforms to to execute the survey. I think that's terrific. But once you get the survey's results, then somebody in inside of the company usually will need to do the analysis to show the statistical relationship between your desired behaviors that, that the survey captures, as well as the leadership and H and and HR practice areas that the survey will also capture. Showing that statistical relationship. Is usually not going to be the responsibility of Qualtrics or Survey Monkey. That has to be done usually inside. Uh, just like you're not going to, just like the finance department doesn't rely on Survey Monkey, and certainly the marketing department doesn't. Uh, but HR can rely upon uh, the Survey Monkey and or others to generate the data. But analyzing the data, that's an intellectual and an analytical activity that needs to be done probably inside the firm just as happens with marketing and finance. Okay. And, you know, employee f uh, feedback uh, has to be has to be genuine and candid. Uh, so do you think employee service should should be truly anonymous uh, so that, you know, there's not any fear of managers and backlash uh, during appraisal, especially during the COVID time where, uh, you know, uh, the employee morale may not have been really high, but, but uh, do you think employees uh, service should, should be anonymous? I think I think that's really an important issue. Yes, they should very definitely be anonymous. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I, I kind of banged around a little bit on 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 consulting firms here a minute ago, but there is an advantage of of using if you can get this the your external uh, consultants uh, to be to be very flexible and 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 designing the survey with you based upon what the principles we've talked about earlier. Then there, the advantage of using an external survey firm is that, uh, is that you can promise, is you can 
reinforce the perception of anonymity uh, with the survey. Uh, oh, I, you know, but that's that's an ongoing problem. I just a quickly quick funny story. Uh, we had a um, uh, we did a survey did a survey with the company, and there was one person who was absolutely convinced that that we knew her 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 survey results. She said, "You know exact. I don't trust you. You know." You you have the ability to know exactly who who's who's responding to what questions and how they're responding, and I don't like that. I said no no. Listen, we're using an external firm. the The company itself doesn't have the company doesn't have access to the raw data. Uh, we can't connect who's responding to. We just don't know who's. And furthermore, to be honest, uh, I won't give you the woman's name. We don't really care what your responses are. I mean, what we care about is the responses mm -hmm. of the total organization. So, so she settled down. Now we got the results, but we wanted to do a focus group with the company to help identify, to help clarify in greater depth what some of the why some of the results were. And so we did a random survey, a random survey of of people to to be involved in these focus groups. And as it turned out, this woman was selected as one of the random select, and she came to us and say, "See, I told you so. You really." So anyway, the punchline is the that. Maintaining anonymity, I think, must be guaranteed and must be strongly protected. Correct. And, you know, I, I quickly want to do the top three. Uh, do you have any favorite uh, business books? Uh, my favorite business books? Ah, that's yeah. a great question. I don't, uh, let me reframe the question slightly. Uh, if I'm, it's not so much the business books, I, I look at who's writing the books. So I don't go after titles, I go after authors. So, so uh, uh, um, another question might be, who are some of the better, th who, who do I, who do I read? Not what do I read? So I read, I read, well, <laughs> I read my own stuff, but, but that's kind of self-serving. Uh, but I, I, there's three people that I read regularly to, to stay intellectually informed. One is Dave Ulrich. You, you'll know, of course, everyone will, will know Dave's work. Uh, second, Ram Sharon. Ram Sharon is a very clear thinker. And finally, uh, uh, Gary Hamill, I think, is a very good thinker, too. So those are three of the people on a global scale uh, the, the, that, I, that I read. And there's some people in, 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 in India that, I've done, that I think have done some very insightful writing, too. Ram Sharon is a former head of HR at ICICI Bank, wrote a book here recently, that I thought was very insightful, um, and and uh, so so there there's some good good people, some very smart people that write. So punchline is I go after authors, not after titles. Do you, do you follow any HR leader or a CEO uh, whom you think you know lead uh, listeners should also follow? Um, that's a difficult question because there are many good HR leaders both around the world and in India. Uh, but I think that you know you go for. Uh, not the HR leaders, but the organizations that are doing some interesting things. Clearly, Disney continually reinvents itself. Right. So I track I track Disney pretty closely. Right. Uh, and and notice I'm not tracking the HR. I'm tracking the HR practices and the leaders that are leading. I think uh, other companies uh, such as Amazon, um, Amazon's doing some great TCS in, in India, Emphasis. Uh, all of the Tata companies are, are 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 work very hard to be state of state of the art across the Tata Sons. Um, uh, Reliance, I think, does some some great work. Uh, L LNG does some great work. So I I think you want to think about some great work. Now I also think though outside of India, I think about Amazon, I think about Google, I think about Microsoft. Microsoft is so interesting because it continually reinvents itself. You know, for a while, you know, Amazon was a little bit, or uh, Microsoft was on the ropes, and now it's reinvented itself. And, and it, what's interesting to, in, in ex, a lot of the executives from these companies come from India, as, as you well know. I don't need to tell you that. Um, okay. So, so there, there's really good companies that are doing some great work. All right. And Dr. Wing, uh, what is the one piece of advice would you give to young HR leaders who want to make a career in HR, and especially those? young graduates who are graduating this year in, in the tough environment of COVID? I think that's a great question. Um, 
there's I have three bits of advice. Number one is the intellectual activity for HR is to continually ask yourself the question, how do our people need to think and behave differently in the future? How do people, now when I say people, I mean collectively, how does the total organization, how do people together in my, com in my company need to think and behave differently in the future than they have in the past so that we get better numbers in the future? And then once we understand how people need to think and behave, then what are the levers I'm going to put into place to make sure that our people develop those ways of thinking and behaving so they develop those ways of thinking and behaving that will meet the requirements of our customers and competitors before our competitors uh, achieve those ways of thinking and behaving. That's, the I think, a fundamental choice. The second choice is, uh, and a very important choice for young of fledgling HR executives, is what's your unit of analysis? Unit of analysis means, what am I focusing on? Am I focusing on individual people or I'm focusing on the organization? Now, that seems like, a, wh why do you make that distinction? Why do I make that distinction? Because that's a big distinction. <laughs> if you're going to focus on individual talent, which is kind of the flavor of the month in HR, uh, if you focus on individual talent, then you're going to major in psychology because individual talents means you're going to focus on individual people. You're defining people to be individuals. But that, by definition, if you focus on individual people, you're going to end up making the whole equal to the sum of the parts. And, but, and you would major in psychology. You understand how people, how individual people function. But if you're going to focus on organization, and there's significant research that shows that, that organization outperforms individuals rather substantially, if you're going to focus on, on organizational capability, then you're going to major in economics. You're going to major in business. You're going to major in maybe organizational sociology. You're going to focus on, on not how individuals function, but how the organization functions. And people that focus on organizations, you major in, in economics, for example, studying the theory of the firm, which comes out of economics. Then you can take, you can major in economics and never take a psychology class. You can take a major in psychology and never take an economics class. So that distinct, that decision about whether you're going to focus on individual people or organization capability as a fledgling HR professional is one of the most fundamental decisions you're going to make. And at least the research in economics says that, that the economics perspective will almost all, will, will outperform the individual perspective at a ratio of about four to one. Now, I don't have time to go into that research right now, but, uh, but that research is available in the most recent book that Dave Ulrich and I wrote called, uh, Competing on the Edge. So, uh, or, uh, yeah, uh, we're, we're, excuse, me, that, that, excuse me, excuse me, I just messed up. That was the former title. Uh, the, the current title is, uh, Victory Through Organization. And that's the thesis of the book that we, that HR professionals need to focus on organization capability in addition to the foundation of, of individual talent. So those are two recommendations. Those are two recommendations. Got it. And uh, uh, Dr. Wayne, what they say people can reach out to and know more about your work? Uh, well, I'm at the University of Michigan. My uh, my email address is is w b is in boy r o c k at u m i c h dot e d u so I'm, and I have, I, I respond very quickly to emails and then be delighted to hear from any of your, any of your colleagues to clarify anything I've said or to provide additional insights and perspectives. Right, uh, Dr. Wynn, thank you so much for taking your time. I know it's really early for you uh, and I'm really happy that we had this chance to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed my conversation with you. It's an honor to be with you today and good luck and Godspeed in your important work. Thanks for listening to Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. Please do subscribe to Vantage HR Influencers Podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify for new episodes.